Yosef Gulyoman. Today we'll be chatting with Yusuf Munaya, Executive Director of the Palestine Center here in Washington, D.C. We'll be talking about the re-election of President Barack Obama and what this means for Israel and Palestine. Yusuf, thank you for joining us on the show today. It's good to be with you. So the million dollar question is, what can we expect in the second term from Barack Obama? Well, that is the, uh, the million dollar question. Um, it's, it's a little bit hard to tell, of course, what the future is going to look like, but there are a couple uh, indicators from the past that, that give us an idea of what we can expect. Um, first, we do know that second-term presidents tend to be more engaged uh, in um, the, the, the Middle East peace process, if you will, uh, in their second terms. Obviously, because the domestic constraints that are involved in, in re-election uh, that have to do with pro-Israel interest groups here in the United States are not as much of a factor. That doesn't mean they're not still a factor, but not as much as a, a, of a factor. Uh, but there are other complicating factors that suggest that it will not be easy for uh, President Obama to engage himself. Uh, first, on the domestic front, uh, this is a president who has made it clear that he wants to achieve a number of very important um, domestic political uh, achievements, uh, including one that he's identified in his first and second term now as a priority, which is immigration reform. If the president is going to be focused on, on Middle East peace, uh, it is going to be difficult for him to devote the kind of focus necessary for that. And I think at, at this point, uh, given the situation on the ground, uh, the amount of presidential involvement would have to be very significant for there to be any, any movement. Um, it will be difficult for him to do that while pursuing grand-scale domestic political issues. The other problem, of course, is that um, you have upcoming now in Israel an election, uh, an election that, as far as um, anyone can really tell, is going to be won by right-wing uh, Israeli parties that are uh, not conducive uh, to uh, ending settlement expansion that are, uh, in fact, relying on the uh, votes uh, in the settlements and will uh, owe a lot to that constituency should they get uh, elected. Uh, and, and so that is going to also be an obstacle for President Obama to get involved. Um, if I was an advisor to President Obama looking at the situation and thinking about what Obama can realistically accomplish, I may very well tell him it's going to be difficult for you to achieve much on the front of Middle East peace. If you're going to invest your time, and when we're talking about a second term president, political capital has got to be spent in the first couple years, because after that we're already talking about lame duck session and, and the next presidential elections, which are starting earlier and earlier. If you're going to spend your political capital and you want to do something big, it doesn't look like the situation is ripe for doing something on the Middle East. During the debates, Israel-Palestine was not the issue at all. There was a bigger focus on Iran and Syria, for example. Um, could, this, could there possibly be a linkage there moving forward? I think the region does complicate um, any efforts the president would make uh, on the question of Palestine. Uh, and I think, actually, right now, um, the bigger issue than Iran uh, is Syria. Uh, and it's really unclear what is going to happen moving forward in Syria. And uh, many people uh, have uh, suspected that the president was waiting for uh, the election to go uh, and conclude before taking steps uh, in Syria. Um, there's obviously a huge destabilizing factor uh, involved there, uh, and it, it, it's very unclear how it's going to play out. Um, the Iranian issue um, is, is one that really the Israelis have been pushing. And by, by the Israelis, it's really been the Israeli political establishment led by the right, by, by, by Netanyahu, that has made the issue bigger than it is, in part to distract from the Palestinian question uh, and to play into American domestic politics and became a very significant issue in the American um, domestic political discussion because Obama has been so hawkish on national security 
that the Republicans had fewer and fewer points from which to attack him from the right, except on Iran and you know extreme love of Israel, uh, and 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 so it it became a politicized question. I think it's likely to become less of an issue uh, now that the uh, election has passed. Speaking of the Israeli election, which you brought up already, um, there's some discussion or some speculation that there could be fallout uh, after basically Netanyahu seems to be tacitly or explicitly in some cases supporting Romney. Do you see there a possibility for there being uh, a fallout? Uh, I, I think there may be some. I don't think it's going to be significant enough to alter the outcome. Um, the uh, uh, biggest issue right now in uh, Israeli politics is really the lack of an alternative to uh, Benjamin Netanyahu. And the most dominant personalities other than Benjamin Netanyahu are uh, on the right as well, are the Avigdor Liebermans. Uh, so I don't think that that's going to be a significant enough of, of an issue to really change things. When it comes to Israeli politics, it comes down to coalition building and the math. And the math is just not there for anything but a right-leaning coalition. Um, unless something changes drastically, uh, and, and the demographics over time suggest it's only going to continue moving in this direction, it's hard to imagine anything but a, a right-wing constellation uh, that, that ends up um, leading uh, the Israeli government. That being said, despite what appears to be, you know, uh, something of a clash between Netanyahu and President Obama, um, Netanyahu is seen by many Israelis as one of the best options for working with the United States. Um, he has a, a history in working with the United States, has a history in Washington, has very close personal ties uh, to uh, political figures within the United States. His uh, English is perfect. Uh, and compared to many others on the uh, Israeli political scene, he still is uh, one of uh, seen as one of the best options for interfacing with the United States. So you, it seems like you don't have an overly positive uh, prognosis of the Palestinian situation. Is there anything that the Palestinian leadership can do, or do you see anything coming down the line that could offer to disrupt you know, this kind of status quo that you described? Well, I don't. I, I think in the short term, um, it's it's uh, it's hard to be optimistic. Um, however. Uh, I, th I think we have reached a, a point, um, and I think we reached this point uh, quite some time ago, but it's becoming more and more clear now to the point where it cannot be denied that we've, we've crossed the threshold, uh, that the paradigm that Oslo created, that has been the, the larger framework in which the Israeli-Palestinian diplomatic relations have operated under is going to change. Um, that is increasingly seen as a failure and uh, has really only survived up to this point uh, because of emergency initiatives to try to keep its head above water. Would and you describe the United Nations bid as that kind of effort? I think the United Nations bid really is is a um, is an attempt to do something because there's little else to do um, and there's little else within the capacity of those leaders within that framework of Oslo to do anything else. Um, I, I I don't see it as a as a um, uh, strategically uh, beneficial move in the long term. It'll probably have uh, very little impact because the Israelis still control uh, what is going on on the ground and are literally changing the geography. Uh, that ultimately is what is going to determine the direction uh, of, of this situation. Uh, and uh, I don't think Barack Obama, uh, now that he is reelected, is going to be able to change that in the short term. Um, what it will do, and this is where if there is um, optimism, I think it is in this area, that we are headed towards a major paradigm shift. Uh, and we're already there, but we're, what we're really headed towards is everybody agreeing that we're there. Uh, and, and I think what that means ultimately uh, is that um, we're going to wake up to a reality across the board, even at the higher diplomatic levels, that the two-state initiatives 
uh, as we've seen them, as we've come to know them, uh, are no longer possible. And so, you know, what's, what does that lead to next? Well, that leads to talking about different alternatives. You know, many, many people are, um, you know, very, uh, very quick to move from a two-state solution to a one-state solution or to a, a federalized or, or a regional or whatever type of solution. But before you can get to that point, you have to talk about it. Yeah. Uh, and, and there has been such a stigma surrounding any discussion outside of a two-state solution. Um, that it's been impossible to talk about what these outcomes can look like. Uh, and so I think the next step is going to be um, in increasing realization that the two-state outcome is not going to happen and the beginning of a discussion of alternative outcomes. Uh, and, and from that comes policy formulation. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, in the short term, we're not going to see too much change. Uh, but in the next, you know, f five to ten years or so, we're going to see a major shift in the way we talk about resolving the Palestinian question. I'm not sure how closely we're following the congressional outcome, um, but at that level, were there any changes that would have any impact on, on U.S. foreign policy in that part of the world? You know, I, th I think in the grand scheme of things, probably not. Um, I think we can uh, point to one or two cases where um, um, particular candidates with extremely right-wing um, extremely hawkishly Zionist um, narratives that were extremely comfortable with peddling Islamophobia as well uh, on the uh, domestic level, um, those candidates in some cases have lost. Uh, and, I, and, and I think that is a positive thing, that Americans have rejected those types of narratives, um, uh, particularly Joe Walsh um, in the Chicago area. Uh, who was very much opposed to Palestinian independence in, in, in any form uh, and, and also involved with heavily peddling Islamophobia. Um, so I, I think that um, Americans have rejected those narratives in certain places. Um, I, I know as well Michelle Bachman, uh, who ended up winning, um, almost lost and, and ran a much tighter race than, than, than she expected. Uh, I, I think the fact that those narratives are being rejected are important. Um, I think that, um, that, that that's going to be helpful for a, a, uh, a discussion at the congressional level, but we're still talking about a Congress that is very solidly pro-Israel. So one very noticeable difference for observers of the Middle East um, is that in 2008, Palestinians and Arabs in general were very excited about Barack Obama's presidency. You just don't see that with this current election. Uh, why, do you, why is that the case? Well, I, I think for a couple of reasons. First, remember where we were in, in 2008 uh, was at the culmination of two terms of disastrous American foreign policy in the region under um, George W. Bush, um, uh, the uh, invasion of Iraq, um, the blank check of support uh, to Israel, uh, and um, uh, Ariel Sharon the uh, expansion of settlements under Israeli governments. And so the defeat, I think, of that somebody other than George W. Bush was to be elected was seen as a, a very hopeful thing because it meant the end of that era. Uh, and I think that it was um, uh, an individual from the opposite party, but also an individual uh, who people, not just in the Middle East, but outside of the United States and the global South in general could identify with. Because of his background, because of his heritage, because of the color of his skin, um, people saw in Barack Obama um, someone who could identify with the world in ways that um, the, the traditional candidates for the American presidency could not. And so they expected a degree of sympathy, I think, uh, and were hopeful for that they hoped for change. What they came to realize, though, was that despite the intentions of, of a president, and whatever those intentions may be, a policy in the United States, as far as uh, the Middle East is concerned, specifically on the question of Israel-Palestine, um, can be handcuffed by Congress uh, and by election concerns. When you have a president like Barack Obama or anyone else, 
uh, even if they have the best of intentions for, um, for resolving the Palestinian question, for providing Palestinian self-determination, for limiting Israeli colonization, they still have to deal with the reality that they need to be reelected, they want to be reelected, and they have a staunchly pro-Israel Congress that is going to handcuff them at every turn. Uh, and so what I believe was so devastating for Palestinians and people concerned about the Palestinian issue is they saw in Barack Obama what may have been the single greatest hope for resolving this conflict for um, Palestinian self-determination uh, turning out to be no different than anyone else. And so what I think they lost faith in is uh, conclusively the possibility that the United States could ever act as a mediator to deliver uh, this issue. So if Obama is not able to do it, nobody's going to be able to do it. Uh, and I, I, I think that after the first term that he had and how quickly he backtracked on the issue of settlements, um, many people realize that it's not just about the president. America is systematically pro-Israel because of its domestic politics, and therefore um, it doesn't matter who the president is. So after this realization that the president's more of an institution and not some great leader that just can sort of sweep in with the, you know, his own charisma or abilities and, and make sudden change in policy, uh, what's the current mood you know, among Palestinians in terms of their political faith? Well, I think there's a great degree of confusion right now. And I, and I think that is due in large part because of a void in leadership and division among the uh, traditional political establishment. Uh, you have in the uh, PLO, which is overlapping what is now the, the Palestinian Authority in, in the West Bank, no serious initiatives uh, for delivering Palestinian rights. Uh, the, uh, the most significant initiatives that we've seen are symbolic gestures at the United Nations, um, which really are not translating into tangible gains. The only changes that Palestinians on the ground are seeing on a daily basis are the continued expansion of Israeli settlements. Uh, and I, I think that, um, you know, for Palestinians in the West Bank um, who are looking at the West Bank today versus 10 years ago versus 20 years ago are realizing that all this talk about a Palestinian, a viable, contiguous Palestinian state, state emerging in the West Bank is fantasy. And so there's, there's a real void of respect and legitimacy for leaders who are talking about something that is increasingly appearing to people on the ground as impossible. And um, that, of course, is a tremendous problem. So, uh, unfortunately, there is no alternative that has really emerged yet in terms of um, being able to mobilize um, large numbers of, of Palestinians in a different direction. Uh, and so, uh, right now, we're in this waiting period, it seems, where people realize that the initiatives of the leadership are not going to move them. Uh, towards the direction that they want to go, but also have no clear alternative in terms of leadership for, for where they do want to go. Uh, and, and so it, it, is a, a very, it is a very tense and very depressing time for uh, Palestinians on the ground. But I think that m moving forward, because this paradigm is collapsing, uh, we will see the emergence of something new. We will see the emergence of a shift in a different direction. I think that when change comes uh, because of this, it will probably be rapid, it will probably be uh, messy, uh, but it will probably also open a lot of different doors um, to thinking about different leadership, to thinking about um, uh, uh, different um, representative structures, to thinking about uh, really about the Palestinian people in a completely um, different way and how they, how they see themselves and what their realistic national goals uh, are and how to best achieve them. Well, thank you for the interview, Yusuf. You're very welcome. And thank you for watching Palestine Studies TV.